Ah, yes, the sounds of the sea. It can mean only one thing. It's time once again for Sea and Cedar on Meet Me in the Stacks. Sea and Cedar is a biannual printed digital publication from Vancouver Island Regional Library featuring the voices of Vancouver Island's people. And today they'll be reading their own stories and poems for you, which is good news because I can't do this voice for, for very long. It, it, it hurts. See and Cedar today on Meet Me in the Stacks. Hypothesis. I stopped writing. I stopped writing and my soul was eaten by a thousand fire ants. I sat watching from above, mildly amused, inert. I looked for meaning in coffee stains, their imperfect crescents reminding me of historic brazenness. I looked for meaning in the moss, pressing into it until it bled morning dew, the only impressions that matter. I looked for meaning downtown, wore hooker boots with glimmering buckles while nobody looked, made and served one whiskey sour behind the bar on a Wednesday, and got devoured. I dreamed I was careening off a cliff, but somehow dodged my happy ending, then danced while the tree frogs sang a chorus both nostalgic and new. One day, maybe science, blushing, will admit that everything is placebo, and that's what makes this all real. Hey, this is Jonathan Moskaluk, and I'll be reading my poem, The Fungus Gnat. Through the Dead Sea poems we swam, our silent wings and colossal fingers, careful not to fold, flick, or fumble, pinching the narrow spine wide open. Far from the monstera sticky traps, and somewhere between chapter and verse, the pages sealed like two horizons and the unbleached pulp of sky folded around you, the weight of former words stamping you there, near the upper edge of page 32, ironically positioned above the two of us. The ink of your body, no larger than a comma, is more prominent in death than in life, the way it goes. I pause briefly for a pressed flower, dead in a sea of poems. My name is Marlene Dean. I will be reading two poems. The first poem, Two Ravens. I want to write poems about what birds think, because they do, you know, think. The two ravens, for example, who live in the woods at the end of the road. When my neighbor walks there, they follow him home, because breadcrumbs fall from his hands. As they hop behind him, they look so deferential. If they had caps, they'd be doffing them and calling him Gov. Yet after the handout, they rise up, their wings like velvet oars rowing through the blue air, and I hear them conversing in that odd language they have, which sometimes sounds like the ancient tongues of pottery bells and sometimes like wooden bats striking metal tubes. They are saying, as they look down, how small the man looks when you can see the big picture. Black Wolf I want to write poems about wolves, tell their side of the story. The black wolf I saw in a field beside a road. When I stopped the car to look into his eyes, I saw inside them the fire of the universe before he turned and fled. I longed to call after him that it was okay, but it never is, not with humans. I want to tell you how I saw him again on the front page of a newspaper, posed with the man who shot him, the man's arm around the wolf, as though they were pals, 
sharing the moment, and how the man's eyes looked blank, like the eyes of a man who would shoot the stars from the skies just for target practice if he got the chance. Hi, this is Mary Alyssa reading Bruised and If Life Gave Me Lemons. Bruised. I didn't knock over the peaches, and yet my body will not let me forget the way my neck turned, chin quivered, eyes watered, still looking away, feigning indifference. Faced with the inevitability of picking up the now bruised fruit. I didn't knock over the peaches, and yet I hold the shame and your hand, leading you away, before you do something you might regret. Your idea of regret has always been different than mine. I didn't knock over the peaches, and yet I wish that I had. If Life Gave Me Lemons For years, I've said that I'd like to live somewhere with a lemon tree growing in the yard. The idea of picking fresh lemons makes my chest swell with joy. Lately, not much can do that. Every few days, I would wander outside, leaving the door open to let warm morning air drift into my small bungalow. Barefoot, I'd step off the wooden porch into the lush grass, enjoying the feeling of my floral skirt swaying in the breeze against my skin. Selecting a few ripe ones, I would gingerly pluck them from their branches on the tree and set them into a woven basket with care. I would get to choose exactly which lemons I wanted. After returning to my kitchen, I would gaze at the yellow fruit, allowing the brightness to color my day. In this vision, I don't see you. I would spend time holding them, perhaps whispering to them about the amazing things they would produce, deciding what to do next. A combination of juicing, squeezing, grating, chopping, smelling, savoring, roasting, pan frying, and keeping them in a hand-painted ceramic bowl on my counter. Maybe children would call me the crazy lemon lady, and I think I'd like that. The smell of citrus would settle into my cutting boards and my fingernails. I would still blush every time someone complimented a dish I'd made with each fresh harvest knowing it did indeed taste delicious. In the evenings with the windows slightly ajar, I would smile softly as I washed loaf pans, dull knives, and wooden spoons alone. My name is Petra Chambers, and this is my poem, 12-Year-Old Body. Town kids throw island kids over the bank, into the blackberries behind the gym on the first day of grade eight, according to reliable sources. So she knows what's coming. But first, she navigates six rows of early morning mushroom-colored plastic benches in the salt sticky fairy lounge, each gouged with a compendium of familiar, homophobic and objectifying epithets. The mildest of these, Allison is a fox, hinting at a fundamental question. How does one become a fox? It's four fairies and six buses round trip to high school each day. Disgorge, repeat, recombine in density. She is holding it together in her seat, quite literally. Her thighs look big, they splooch when she sits. So she cinches them with her arms, her hands tucked under tight, practicing invisibility. Pretending she doesn't have a body, she leaves the well-known diesel gloom of the golden yellow bus 
crosses the customary iron ramp, still slick with nighttime's damp, onto the gently pitching deck to cross the swift, deep channel. The tiny lounge is over full. Big, bristling boys place smaller boys upside down in garbage cans for the duration of the crossing and wrestle over rows of benches. Giants brawling, their colossal feet in dirty sneakers fly across the sky. Girls poised, worldly jaded, and composed ignore all these shenanigans. Sit, talk, smoke, rise in unison, evocations of shampoo and self-possession swirling in their wake as the ferry nears the shore. From the scant periphery of this new state, she studies hard, pairs vocabulary, stops reading, starts smoking, stops eating. How does one become a fox? These boats and buses convey her body, and with every sailing, the coast of childishness grows wild, untended, half, remembered. Rite of passage is in the crossing. The Other Hand by Richard Utes. Not the one that leads highest on the axe or sledge, weighing against the tiller, selecting the ripest blackberries, or perhaps indolently pushing back hair. Not the one that uses the knife, eases open the throttle, or twists and pulls the cork. No, that second hand following the slowly realized companion. The sun bleached hairs on its arm, skin now darkened and drawn by dryness. A scar just above the outer wrist, its arteries raised by the heat. The one easily tended hand in waiting. The one checking the water's warmth, caressing your thigh or cheek, steadying the steering wheel on weaving roads or in reverse, less apt to reach but just as able like fish fin creasing the calm lake or bird swoop for insects at dusk motions more than themselves. It reaches for the worn rail to steady its owner in the climb. This hand quietly grips the aging summer, the textures of metal and wood, so that along the plains of possibility, it too, sharing the impact of diving, can be part of the hope and thrust. Age by Richard Hughes. I have come to believe a stealthy tailor sews into my clothes each night an array of worn river stones. I believe the stitching is perfect, yet the lagging cuffs and collars suggest where the weight sits. I believe the rocks slowly play against my movement and turn the day's ease into effort. I am sure each rock is a geography unto itself and a universe of atoms within. I am sure the rocks were swept from shaded banks of clay, agate and ages past. I am sure they were selected with care from the inside curves of beautiful rollicking rivers. I am sure that the rivers are of no mind to miss any of the specimens I carry. I am equally sure you are visited by the same subtle tailor with his unseen heaviness.
No to Potlucks, Yes to One Cook Dinner Parties. Written by Shelley Stein Watton. My friends, I come to you with a proposition, nay, a call to action. The potluck must be held accountable for its discrimination toward allergy sufferers and the diet restrictive. We must have justice for these people who walk among us. Allow me to tell you the story of a young woman, a young woman who is smart, thoughtful, and only slightly caustic. Folks, this woman is me. I grew up in 1990s suburbia. From certain angles, it didn't seem like suburbia because it was hugged by pockets of forest, still diverse in native flora and fauna. But the human element gave it away, for it was a monoculture of European-descended flesh-eaters, lovers of pale-colored vegetables and all shades of meat. I was brought up in a vegetarian household, a rarity at the time, by a mother who had danced with vegetarianism in her pre-children life and a father who preferred power tools to whisks and simply ate what was in front of him. So, you're vegetarian. Do you eat chicken? was a common question from the parents of my friends. These people had not heard of legumes. As lacto-ovos, potluck gatherings were problematic. My mother was calculated about each dish she would bring. It needed to be a complete meal for our family of four, since all the other offerings plunked down on the vinyl tablecloths contained some sort of meat in ball, disc, or tube form. We had all been contestants in the guessing game of, is there meat underneath that layer of melted cheese? Most often we ended up the winners of a surprise flesh deposit into a napkin. To avoid that fate, lining up for mealtime became a mad dash to the spot where Chef Mom's Pyrex sat to assure its contents weren't missing before we wended our way to its location. The other event guests would stiffen when they saw your single selection plate. I guess my buffalo ranch chicken dip isn't good enough for you, Linda from the school carpools, I said. So when I told you everyone loves my hamburger chili, that wasn't enough of a consensus for you? Lance from across the street's eyebrows asked. The bacon is only on top, just flick it off, Lori's mouth blurted. It was a real bonding experience where everyone felt heard and understood. But that was the 90s. Now that basing meals around plants is common, if not verging on de rigueur, Vegetarian options at a potluck are easy to come by, and few flinch when you pass on their prized sausage rolls. Injustice solved, you may say. But that's only half the story, my good people. I've been packing an EpiPen since 2006, when the peanut let it be known that its deleterious effect on my systems will become ragingly worse with each accidental exposure. Since then, I've had the displeasure of stabbing myself twice and have drowned myself in Benadryl on at least four occasions to ward off the above-mentioned stabbing. I make a hard pass at any bakery that displays peanut butter cookies. I skip out on restaurants that have a thing for peanut sauce. But the potluck remains the greatest minefield of all. I politely line up with everyone else, plate in hand. The other guests are tantalized by the mounds of culinary creations loading up their plates, ready for a taste explosion. I, meanwhile, scan for the food that's raw and undressed. Pickles. Crudite. Fresh fruit. These are the safety foods of the severely allergic. Once or twice I've taken a chance on hummus, though the anxiety-induced heart palpitations weren't worth it. I settle in at a table with my sparse little plate, considering how I can make six carrot sticks and a wedge of cheddar last as long as my table companion's plates of noodle salads, spicy rice, and deep-fried cauliflower. No wonder you're so skinny, Miriam teases. I give a half-hearted laugh, but dare not say I'm not eating anything that has more than one ingredient because I have an allergy. If I do... I am invariably confronted by the helper, 
the helper insists on telling you which dishes don't have peanuts in them, running a spoon through each casserole dish to proclaim, this one looks good. The helper takes your hand and wanders over to each table to ask, who made the eggplant? And, Marianne, your baked tofu doesn't have peanuts in it, does it? A nice gesture, you may say. No, my pals, it is not. It's what we in life call crossing boundaries. The helper takes it upon themselves to save you from the terrible pain they perceive you are in. The helper doesn't check in to learn that, yes, I am more comfortable nibbling on a cucumber for an hour than heading home and snarfing a grilled cheese. Besides, no matter how assured the helper may feel by confirming with Moshe that his enchiladas are peanut-free, the helper is not the one who may have to barf in two hours and feel her throat start to close up, leading to the reacquaintance of her thigh muscle with a sharp metal object. I do not ask for the potluck to change, but the ubiquity of it must diminish. In our hot-to-be-inclusive world, the potluck doesn't live up to standards. The dinner party, my friends, does. The dinner party is a planned affair. It has a designated cook, a curated menu, a host who inquires about dietary needs prior to guest arrival. And, because everything written from 2020 to present must somehow relate back to COVID-19, the dinner party is pandemic times approved, assuring serious cleanliness control. For a fun pre-dinner activity, you can invite your guests to watch you wash your hands before tossing the salad. In short, the dinner party is thoughtful and sensible. Plus, it doesn't run the risk of dolmades being served alongside sriracha taco casserole. Citizens of the world, the potluck purports to create community through the equitable sharing of food. But how great is this community if it isolates people like this kind, sophisticated young woman whose story I just shared? And really, how equitable is the friendly potluck when Raphael dumps a bag of pretzel sticks in a bowl and Rupa cooks a huge birani? My people, say no to the potluck. Let this radiant young woman be free of the paranoia of multi-kitchen prepared food. Say yes to community, to connection found through a shared meal, but at a dinner party prepared by one fatigued cook. And if you really miss that mixed plate of having hot cheese dip flow into your pineapple pendouti, I'm sure the cook is open to requests. Kerberos means spot by T.J. Radcliffe. There is an island in the Archeron where Sharon sometimes stops to have a beer and throw a ball for Spot, who's supposed to guard the gates that lead off to the other place, but mostly rides along and greets the dead, hoping for some kindness. Don't we all? He is a dog prodigiously outsized, playful, stern, and loyal all at once. Three heads make for a complex kind of beast. But he has one heart. It is a dog's, and many souls are gladdened by the sight of his one tail that wags in greeting as they board the ferry over to the far and strangely distant bank. For now the dead are on the final leg. Their destination is that place where once they were before. Is it a nothingness? A gray lost gloom? A place of misery? Or paradise? I'm not allowed to say. But it's a place where after disembarking from the punt, a happy dog gambols along the shore and hopes that some kind soul will pet this head or that, and often is rewarded.
Metal Man by Eric Hakim In the basement a snowmobile dissected Exposed tracks like a tank undressed Nuts, bolts, bullets sprawl across the kitchen table A mechanic's bouquet The front yard a spread of cars with windows pressed out Ignition boxes missing, gifted to another cause closer to driving I never knew a man who so loved machines, moved so fast, broke so many bones, who never sleeps. November cold snap, he spits blood on white snow, from the metal now part of his lungs. Years of welding other people's dreams, Tokyo to Mexico, cruise ship wasteland. Never once did the metal man dip into the ocean. Would he sink? Postcards by Kate Sandilands. One. M. Just landed. What a day. Plane three hours late because of all the YWG snow. Bumpy ride, which you know I hate. Going to the residences now. So tired. Wish you were here. Miss you already. Love, C. X. O. The second she felt the plane come to a decisive stop at the terminal, Claire unbuckled her seatbelt and pulled her bag from the overhead bin, with or without the flight attendant's permission. She changed her watch, 8.15 Winnipeg time, but only 6.15 in Vancouver, so there was a chance the airport store would still be open. She drummed her boot on the floor as the rows of passengers in front of her disembarked. She wished again she were the sort of traveler who could afford business class. Her university was strict about expenses, so she had to wait, fidgeting, along with everyone else in economy. When she was finally free of the plane, she rushed to the store and bought five postcards just as the cashier slid the door closed, one for each night of her stay. Vancouver at night, a close-up of English Bay, Grouse Mountain, and two she thought Mel might like of BC Wildlife an eagle, and an orca. She chose the whale to send send first, put a stamp on it from the supply in her wallet, addressed it to home, and wrote it quickly in one of the departure lounges. It might not get to Mel until Claire was already back home, but that wasn't the point. She picked up her suitcase from the carousel, found a mailbox, and slipped in the card before hailing a cab out to UBC. In the car, she exhaled, It was raining, and she ignored the driver's sporadic attempts at conversation to focus on its soft metallic pinging on the roof. It made her feel safe and self-contained. After the desk clerk checked her in and handed her the key, Claire found her suite, unlocked it, and closed the door behind her with a satisfying click. She turned on the light and looked around. At least she could claim one of the nicer private apartments for her research at the archives. It was more than she expected. There was a kitchenette with table and chairs, a couch couch across from a large TV, and a double bed through a sliding door. She tested the bed and felt the glorious crispness of fresh, tight sheets. She looked around the walls at the vaguely tasteful West Coast prints, anonymous and abstract, which pleased her. She checked the drawers and cupboards in the kitchen. Corral cups and plates, basic cutlery and pots, a tea towel, some dishwashing liquid, paper packets of salt and pepper in a bowl. Simple. Perfect. No food, of course. She looked at her watch and for a second considered ordering pizza. There was a phone beside the couch, but no directory. Mel would no doubt take yet another opportunity to chastise her for her refusal to get a cell phone. Mel had, herself, just bought a fancy 2009 Blackberry Flip as soon as it hit the market. But Claire didn't mind the occasional inconvenience as a trade-off for privacy and quiet. She would get some groceries and investigate takeout tomorrow. Tonight, she could go out. She found the folding umbrella in her suitcase and ventured into the rain in the direction of the campus pub she'd seen from the taxi. The pub was full, but the hostess found her a small table in a wood-paneled corner. 
From the chalkboard menu on the wall, Claire chose fish and chips and a pale ale. She listened to the chatter of students around her as they complained about the amount of homework they'd been given over reading break. She smiled, thinking about her own undergraduate class and their assignment, Anne-Marie MacDonald's Fall on Your Knees, which would keep them busy for a while. She didn't have to respond to them or anyone else for five whole days. The fish and chips were mediocre. The freedom was delicious. She ordered a celebratory single malt and sipped it slowly as she pored over her research notes in advance of the archives tomorrow, stretching out the evening as long as she could. Two. M. Great day in the archives so far. Letters to Jane from Marian Engel, Margaret Lawrence, Anne Cameron, Margaret Atwood. So much more to do, I'm not sure I'll get through it all. Resident suite is okay, comfortable but basic. We'll check in to take out for tonight. The archives are cold. Should have brought your cardigan. Love, C, X, O. The next morning, the clock on the bedside table buzzed at seven, waking her from a deep sleep despite the time difference. She made the bed, showered, dressed, gathered her things, and added the umbrella to her bag, even though it wasn't raining anymore. She found coffee and a cranberry muffin at a Starbucks in the nearly empty Student Union Building food court and perched on a stool to finish them. She made her way to the basement of the library building, the Learning Center, they called it, that housed the university's archives and special collections. She locked her coat and bag into a neat cubicle, took her camera, pencils, and notepaper in with her, and asked the archivist to bring out the 26 boxes she'd requested by email over a month ago. Jane Rule Fonds, Correspondence Series, 1947 to 2000, 3.72 meters of textual records. The archive reading room was empty except for a young-looking man in a pale blue sweater already intent on his papers in the far end of the room near the rare books display. Claire chose a place at one of the long wood tables and waited. She considered going out to the locker to get her coat. It was almost colder in the room than it had been outside. She shivered and pulled down the cuffs of her shirt. As she waited, she wondered in passing what the young man was studying. Then her thoughts turned to Mel and how her day was going, how she would be wondering what Claire was doing. She considered what Mel might want to know about the room, the rain, the dinner she had last night, whether she'd met anyone interesting. She willed away the distraction that tried to focus on what she was here to do. The archivist arrived at last with ten of the file boxes on a rolling cart and reminded her again to be careful handling the papers. Pencils only, he said, pointing to her yellow notepad, and no post-it notes. As he walked back to his glassed-in office, Claire took a moment to look at the cart. It always felt like Christmas, that first moment in a box of papers, and she didn't want to rush it, even though she knew she only had a few days to work through dozens of files. She chose a box from the top of the cart, likely not the most important one, but still exciting, placed it on the table, and pulled out a file from the front. Three hours later, she realized she was not only cold, but also stiff and hungry. She stood up, stretched her arms over her head, and wheeled the cart back to the archivist's office to take a lunch break. The sun had come out while she was in the basement, so she took her food court tuna wrap outside to sit at a metal table on the patio. She reveled in the unexpected warmth and pulled out the second postcard to write, It would be beastly cold in Winnipeg. She decided against mentioning to Mel the camellias coming into bloom around her. When she finished her lunch, she dropped the card in the mailbox by the learning center. Claire arrived back at her basement locker to find the young man also there, stowing his coat and preparing for the afternoon's work. She avoided eye contact, wanting to get back to her files, and busied herself with her pencils and paper so he wouldn't have any reason to notice her. Hi, he said over her shoulder, piercing her bubble of invisibility. I'm sorry to intrude, and I'm sure you're really busy, but I'm always interested in what other people are doing here. I'm researching Chinese-Canadian business history in Vancouver for my PhD at U of T. I've spent so many hours in this room, I'm bored with my project and fantasize everyone else is working on things that are so much more interesting, like maybe someone really famous. 
Claire looked up as he paused for a second. She wasn't sure whether or how to respond. Would Jane Rule be famous enough for him? He didn't give her time to decide. I haven't seen you before, he concluded. Why are you here? Claire chose to reply in as few words as possible. I'm writing about Canadian women writers' friendships. Jane Rule's papers are here. The explanation came out like a dismissal, and when his face withered with embarrassment, she immediately regretted it. She didn't want to get friendly with anyone on this trip. Goodness knows it would only complicate things. But she also didn't want to be rude, especially to a breathless, eager graduate student. She felt compelled to add, I'm just here for a few days, you know, a flying visit to see what's here. I'm in the middle of Jane's letters from Mary and Engel. They're really good. Jane was friends with Margaret Lawrence and Margaret Atwood, too, and a lot of other famous writers. So I'm looking to see what they wrote and how they supported each other. Engel had a lot of stuff going on, and Jane was really there for her. Oh, that's so great! His face brightened again. I wish I was working with interesting letters. I'm mostly looking at old financial records. He seemed to finish the thought. Claire smiled, closed her locker, and moved toward the door to retrieve her boxes from the office. Hey, he said as she turned away. I'm Kevin, by the way. I know your work is super important and all, but maybe we could get dinner tonight after work. I don't want to be presumptuous or anything, but your project sounds great, and I could really just use some conversation with a live person to get out of the heads of all my dead people. Claire had planned to go to the little grocery and take out in the corner for supplies and dinner, to take wonton soup back to the simplicity of her suite, to call Mel, to go to bed early with her dog-eared copy of Jane's Contract with the World for inspiration. But she found herself saying yes. Really, why not? It was all perfectly innocent. Such a nice student. Maybe a future research connection about Vancouver Chinese writers. How could Mel object? Still, she felt a bloom of anxiety in her throat. My name's Claire, she smiled, swallowing it down and extending her hand. And it would be great to have some company. It's good to meet you, Kevin. I bet your research is interesting, and I look forward to hearing about it. The afternoon was full of letters, long ones, short ones, Mary Miggs, Joy Kagawa, Nicole Brossard, Timothy Finley, whose letters Claire read, even though he was not strictly on her list. Business arrangements, personal conversations, arch professional prose, surprisingly intimate detail. Claire took as many photos as she could, but still her hand ached at four o'clock from writing copious pencil notes. Kevin was waiting for her at the lockers. Okay, he said, you're at the residences, right? Let's meet up in front in an hour and get on the bus. There's nothing interesting here, but I have some great rec restaurant recommendations in town. Do you like Thai? I'm craving a good green curry. The pork runs from that takeout are not the greatest. By the time she dropped her bag, triaged her email for anything urgent from work, and made her way to the courtyard in front of the residences, her trepidation had turned to anticipation. She never got to eat Thai with Mal, who didn't like spicy food. Over spring rolls, Kevin explained that his research was inspired by his great-grandparents, who'd lived in Vancouver in the 1920s and been part of the tight Chinese business community. They helped open the Monkyong School, it was one of the first Chinese schools in Vancouver. Most of my family moved to Toronto in the 70s before I was born, but I've always felt a connection to here, he gestured to the street with his chopsticks, so I decided to write my dissertation about it. Claire nodded as she speared a roll with the fork, with the fork her, the waiter had graciously put by her plate. Aren't you worried, she asked as she bit into it, about writing about something so personal for your PhD? Kevin's response surprised her. Isn't your work a bit personal, too? The question hung in the air as Claire chewed. She chose not to answer. Instead, she effused about the freshness of the spring roll. I can't wait to try that green curry, she added. You were right, Kevin. This is a great restaurant. Three. M. Another great day in the archives. So much material. I may have to rethink the paper because the letters from Findlay are intriguing, maybe even more than Atwood's. Bed at the residence is not so comfortable, and I've had zero exercise despite our plan, so I'm blah today. Missing you. Love, C. 
XO. Claire put the third postcard in the mailbox before she went down to the learning center basement. She only had three more days and she was determined to get as much done as possible. At the locker, she thanked Kevin again for a nice dinner but didn't want to encourage him too much. She angled past him into the office to get her boxes. The morning went by quickly. Claire tried not to get distracted by the many other letters in Jane's files, the ones that were not from other writers. It was hard, though, not to get sucked in. The best ones were from Jane's readers, mostly women and many who had experienced Jane's early books as epiphanic. How important it was that she'd written novels and essays with lesbian content. How brave she was to publish them in the 1970s how life-changing her books had been for so many people. Reading them made Clara feel like she was part of an elaborate web of women's lives and voices traced through letters sent back and forth long before the internet made it so much easier to connect with people who shared ideas and experiences. Maybe someone would read Claire's paper someday and feel that kind of connection. God knows her emails were not of arch archival quality. At lunchtime, Claire ducked out before Kevin finished for the morning. She went back to the food court patio with salad and a plastic clamshell and reveled in the quiet, surrounded by sun and camellias and the little tinge of salt on the breeze from the ocean she couldn't see but knew was all there, all around the university. She closed her eyes and breathed deeply. She jumped when Kevin appeared at her table. Hi! He had an enormous steaming cup of coffee in one hand and a sandwich in the other. Sorry to startle you, Claire. I didn't see, see you leave for lunch. Mind if I join you? Claire did mind. She wanted to make a list of files to look at in the afternoon to decide if she had time to look at some of Jane's letters to Helen to find out if, to her life partner, she wrote about her writer friends as much as she wrote to them but there were no other free tables, so she resigned herself to company and nodded to him to sit down. Good morning's work, she asked politely. It wasn't that she had no interest in what he had over dinner told he was reading, some, told her he was reading something to do with an importer-exporter who helped build the school. It was that she knew already that Kevin would talk about it, whether or not, she asked. At least it kept the conversation away from personal questions. Right now, she would rather think about the young writer in Iowa who wrote to Jane in the late 80s because she'd know, she had no one else to talk to about her hesitation to publish a lesbian novel. Claire wasn't sure if the italics in the letter meant a shout or a whisper. Or the genuine love and concern with which Timothy Findlay, Tiff, wrote to Jane about Margaret Lawrence's addictions and failing health or how Jane was clearly not amused by a well-meaning teacher's request to use one of her stories for educational testing for free. She'd mimeographed a long, brittle reply and cc'd the Writers' Union of Canada. She let the letters scroll through her mind as Kevin talked. I guess we should go back? Kevin's question nudged her away from her thoughts. I suppose so, she replied and started out of her seat, but Kevin wasn't finished. Listen, I know you're focused because it's a short trip and all, but I'm going to see a play tonight at the fire hall. The music director is a family friend and she gave me tickets. It's called You're in Town. Yeah, I know it's about pay toilets, but it's supposed to be really good. And I wondered if you'd like to come. Claire loved theater. She also cherished the idea of going to bed with her book and some soup after checking with Mel from the hotel phone, of course, which she still hadn't done since she arrived and about which Mel was likely not happy. Kevin dialed up the eagerness. It won a bunch of Tonys when it ran on Broadway. Come on, you aren't still going to be thinking about your letters at eight o'clock, no matter how interesting, are you? No, Claire conceded she wouldn't. And she reasoned it was just a play. She could figure out how to justify it to Mel later. You're in town was exactly the sort of thing Mel would have hated. Satirical, intertextual, clever, cleverly self-deprecating. Claire couldn't remember how, lo how long it had been since she laughed so hard. You're in good company. Ha! Huh? She chuckled as they left the fire hall, giddy with the simple fun of it all, and was easily persuaded when Kevin suggested a drink at a bar down the street. 
So, she asked him when their glasses arrived, what did you think? She knew he would have a lot to say. He did. As Claire sipped her single malt, he told her his thoughts about the play's strange ending and something he'd read comparing it to Brecht's Threepenny Opera. Then, slightly flushed from his margarita, he proceeded to tell her a funny story about an experience he'd had at a public toilet in Paris when he was there on a high school exchange. There was an actual person at the entrance who pointed to a jar which was full of 10 franc notes. I paid it, and then my billet laughed at what a gullible Canadian I was. How was I to know it really only cost one franc to pee? Claire grinned at Kevin's lack of professional boundaries. She genuinely liked her own graduate students, but none of them had ever discussed peeing with her. Of course, she never got to go for drinks with them, either. At least not without Mel. It was bliss just to relax and listen to his stories, which washed over her like warm waves. Tonight, she didn't have to worry about whether her laughter was too enthusiastic or her eyes too focused on something they shouldn't be. When the server came past again, Claire signaled for another round and leaned over the table toward Kevin. Remember you asked me yesterday whether my research was personal? He raised his eyebrows and nodded. Well, I can't tell you any good stories about public toilets, but I can tell you about the time in my early 20s when I got lost on Galliano Island trying to find Jane Rule's house. I wanted to meet the woman whose work I admire so much, and her neighbors kept sending me the wrong way, on purpose. She found out Kevin was as good a listener as he was a talker, and the stories kept coming. Four. M. Don't know where the days are going. One minute I go to the archives with my list, and next the archivist, our archivist is shooing us out. Lots of notes. I'll have to come back, for sure, but today was a gold mine. Jane and Helen talked a lot about their writer friends. Weather has been much nicer than home, but the rain started again today. Wish you were here. Love, C. XO. Claire overslept her alarm and only made it to the learning center after a quick stop at the Starbucks at 9.15. Today, she was determined to make it through most of the remaining boxes on the cart. A lot more writers, a lot more possible angles, and also Jane's personal correspondence with Helen. Kevin wasn't in the reading room. Perhaps last night's large drinks hadn't sat any better with him than they had with her. He had weeks to finish his work and was probably still asleep. Claire, with only two more days, was envious but dogged. She wrapped her sweater tightly around her chest and started on the next box, wishing she could have brought her coffee in with her. She skipped over a few files to get to where she wanted to begin. Helen. One of the things Claire loved most about the archives was reading the letters and imagining their writers writing, where, they, where and when they were in time and space, what they were thinking and feeling. She imagined she could change, see moods change in their handwriting from one letter or even one paragraph to the next, a surprise, a fight, a reconciliation. As she looked through the files with Helen's letters, letters to Jane, though, there was just page after page of tiny, even script, all addressed from their house in Kitsilano to, Claire supposed, Jane in residence on Galliano, given some of the gossipy references to people in their island community. There weren't a lot of letters from the 1980s onward as Jane and Helen spent most of their lives together in the same place. But in the few there were, the intimacy was extraordinary. Of course, Claire noted the liberal peppering of my darling and beloved throughout. But what struck her even more was the absence of a greeting at the top of many of them. There was no need for a dear Jane or dear Helen. Rather, it was as if they were simply in the middle of an ongoing conversation that had begun in person, slipped seamlessly into writing, and would soon be resumed in person, perhaps over dinner, when they were together again. The letters included precise times, Wednesday, 8.55 p.m., Sunday afternoon, 2.30, and expansive topics, a past conversation, an event that happened when they were apart and needed to be recounted in detail, an ongoing preoccupation that merited another thought in their shared process of understanding, a book they were both reading. So many books. There were the aftermaths, aftermaths of past arguments and probings of ongoing disagreements. There were private jokes Claire couldn't understand. 
There were raw confessions and careful reflections on personal decisions. As she quickly photographed pages to savor later, she found herself marveling at the deep trust reverberating through the words, even when they were about difficult things, a trust that allowed them to write knowing the other was listening. I think now that it was good for us, for me, and for you to find our own ways through these past months. I imagine you find this observation amusing, as you often have when I speak of myself as in any way less than determined. I know how different we are. I also know that my love for you stems from a place of pleasure and respect, not from obligation or sameness or destructive dependence. I know because sometimes I find myself smiling just as if I'd caught an unexpected glimpse of you through a crowd. No matter what, you are my delight. It was nearly one o'clock when Claire finished the box. She sat for a moment, looking at the signature on the last letter, XXXH, and felt like she often did at the end of listening to a symphony, reluctantly coming back into her body while her mind continued to float in the event in which she'd just been enveloped. She needed a break from Jane and Helen's intensity before moving back into anyone else's correspondence. She also desperately needed another coffee, so she packed up her things and returned to the Starbucks, where, to Claire's surprise, the barista recognized her and greeted her. Her name tag, which Claire noticed for the first time, read Lily. The weather had turned, so she chose a seat inside. Between sips of French roast, she pulled out the fourth postcard. Staring at the blank space to the left of her home address, she felt sadness pour through her like the heavy rain on the other side of the window. She couldn't write that she'd imagined seeing Mel and smiled because she'd come to Vancouver partly to get away from her wife's incessant criticism. She couldn't make a thoughtful addition to an ongoing difficult conversation because Mel would find a way of twisting her words into something Claire would never have meant, but for which she would somehow be responsible anyway. Hell, she couldn't even mention Kevin, no matter how ridiculous Mel's simmering jealousy might be. Claire's eyes filled with tears as they did so often when that inner door opened and she came face to face with everything she and Mel had become. She willed the door closed and scrawled some words anyway, because she had to, because the postcard might buy her a day of relative peace at home. She returned to the reading room, Kevin was still nowhere to be seen, thank goodness, and started in again. It was a good afternoon. There were some letters from Phyllis Webb. Maybe with the Audrey Thomas connection there, too, there could be a second paper on women writers in the Gulf Islands. When she got home, she'd have to check to make make sure someone else wasn't already doing that research. Five. M. Last day, I made it through what I came to look at, but I think I've found some other possibilities for the future. Too much to explain here. I'll tell you about it at home. Love, C. X. O. Claire packed up her things and said a reluctant goodbye to her quiet, pleasant room. She left her suitcase at the resident's front desk, greeted Lily when she got her morning coffee and muffin, and returned to the archives for one more day's work before getting on the evening flight back to Winnipeg. Claire had more than enough material for a paper on Jane's friendships with other women writers. There were only a few relevant files left in the remaining boxes. She knew she'd write this paper, that it would get published, that it might even spark some minor interest in the arcane world of Canadian literary history. She finished the files, took some notes about possible cross-references to other writers' archives, and checked through all the boxes one more time to make sure she hadn't missed any younger writers with with whose names she might just not be familiar. She hadn't. It was only 11.30. She did what she'd wanted to do last night as she clicked through the images on her camera of Jean and Helen's letters, touched the actual sheets of paper again. She pulled out the file and, one by one, leafed through them slowly, thinking about how some light letters might dance around the truth, but how these ones were part of a very large and enduring one. When she saw the archivist go into the back room behind his office, she lifted a letter to her nose and inhaled deeply. She thought she could smell a faint trace of Jane's cigarette smoke, mingled in with something sweeter, perhaps Helen's perfume. 
She put the letters away and stacked the boxes back on the cart. As she stood up to leave, she caught Kevin's eye across the room and gestured for him to meet her at the lockers. Are you going? he asked when he joined her. Yes, I am, she, re she replied, back to winter tonight, but I thought we could have lunch before I say goodbye. Sure, said Kevin, just let me put my files back. As Claire waited, she thought about going home. She thought about Mel, who may or may not, depending on her mood, be at the airport waiting for her. She thought about Jane and Helen and the letters they had carefully saved to be read again and again and again, and the kind of trust it took them to even let the hard parts of their loving live on in the archives. She pulled out the last postcard from her bag, the one with the eagle. She would post it to Mel from the box outside the sub on her way to lunch. She looked at what she'd written on it that morning. She smiled, thinking about the many other possibilities she'd found. Postcards is part of a research creation project, Dear Jane Rule, that explores the life, work, and extraordinary epistolary relationships of the iconic lesbian West Coast author Jane Rule. Rather than describe and discuss the reach and impact of her letters and published writings, the project aims to animate these relationships by imagining some of the lives of her correspondents and readers as they interacted with Jane and her work. Although the stories are entirely fictional, her impact and legacy are not. Huge thanks to all the Sea and Cedar contributors for reading their work and sharing their voices with us today. If you want to learn more about Sea and Cedar, uh, check the show notes or just Google Sea and Cedar. It pops right up. You can read all about the magazine. You can see the submission guidelines if you want to submit something. You can read all the back issues. You can see all of the amazing work that folks from Vancouver Island are doing. And if you're wondering whether you're too young or too old or too new to make some art, do some writing, uh, you're not. Just do it. Just, uh, just go out and, and make something. Make something uh, that didn't exist <laughs> before you made it exist. You made it happen. Uh, go do that. That's, that's your homework for today. I, I did mine already, so don't, don't at me. I made this, this song that you're listening to, so that's something. All right, this has been Meet Me in the Stacks. Have a wonderful day. Take care of yourselves, <laughs> and we'll see you next time.